My first um, encounter, I should say my first Mananian encounter uh, was of a humiliatingly Bloomian stripe. I was on a visit to my editor's office to discuss the second draft of what was then a slip of manuscript and I was offered a long list of novels that the editor felt it was in my interest to investigate. Uh, and when the question of which Manane's I'd read was raised, uh, I confess that not only had I never read a word that Manane had written, uh, but I'd never even heard of the guy. Um, and to this, my editor recoiled as though I'd hocked a golly in his direction. Yeah. Manane, my editor, informed me, was not only a major author in Australian letters, despite what is often referred to as his lack of wider recognition, but more to the point was one of the brightest stars in my editor's stable. Uh, and as such, he had every right to take my inattention to this important writer as a personal and embarrassing failure on both our professional accounts. So immediately I'm led to a room down the hall. My editor's vast stock of books are kept there and I'm given five titles, the latest of which was Barley Patch, it pressed into my hands. You'll like these, my editor said, uh, in a voice ominous as prophecy. <laughs> uh, despite the weight of this exchange, by the time I got around to reading Barley Patch, the years had run like rabbits. Uh, and not only was my short manuscript now a, a published novel, but Manane too had brought out two further publications. So unsurprisingly, when I came knocking on the office door, declaring to my editor, and I read the first pages of Barley Patch uh, and have come to discuss the wonders I've encountered there. Uh, the look on his face expressed a kind of perplexed wonder at what it was he'd done to deserve such unsolicited and unintelligible harassment. I cannot now recall what it was I said that morning to my editor who showed nothing but passive patience with my claim to have discovered my mental doppelganger uh, in the pages of Gerald's work, but I made it clear that whoever he was, uh, this Gerald fellow, uh, in Barley Patch, in his writing, I discovered not merely a facsimile of the thought being I believed myself to be, uh, but he had, uh, in his eccentric modes and bold assertions of style, shown me the way by which I would become uh, the writer, the writing entity I dreamed one day to be. Now, Encounters of this kind are, I understand and understood even at that time, not unknown amongst writers and readers of fiction. And I considered past discoveries of influence in, say, Kerouac, Whitman, Salinger, Bernhard to have been approximate to this experience, but it had always been a notion of style that had caused me this feeling of false proximity. In the case of Manane, the uncanniness went beyond style or voice. There seemed to be to me a form of thinking so closely resembling my own in those opening sentences of Barley Patch that I could imagine no means by which to separate what was printed on the page from what I thought, felt and hoped to be. Uh, and however I might have expected my editor to respond to this report of reading myself in the work of a master writer, I can see now that I should have anticipated how repulsive such a claim might sound. Uh, my editor, he rose from behind the desk shaking his a grey-haired head with incredulity. He ushered me out the door, he's saying, no, 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 no. Uh, my name's nothing like you, uh, 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 nothing like you at all. And when we were out in the hall, my editor placed a hand on my shoulder and he said with a tone of panic, uh, 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 my name is what you might call a monastic writer, you see. Uh, nothing like your thing. Uh, you're more of a social type, you know. Uh, you're focused on awkward encounters and interactions that are kind of strange. Uh, so there's that. And, and it took me some time to register this reading, uh, and the hallway was very narrow. <laughs> but my editor, he went on, guiding me away from his office. Listen, uh, I'll tell you the secret of Manane's writing, he said, so you understand what I mean and where I'm coming from. The secret is uh, resonance, resonance, uh, recurrence. Uh, and at this point, smooth as a magician, my editor reached down and he snatched up a copy of A Million Windows, which uh, was at that point the latest Manane book, uh, and copies of which just happened to be stacked everywhere all over the place. He said, look here. And the editor, he pointed to an image of a lit window inside a large house on the front cover of the book. 
In this work, my editor says, there's a section where the narrator describes a house of two or three stories with a setting sun reflecting in a window like drops of golden oil, but the work itself is being written by the narrator in the fiction of the book, and the house is a work of fiction in the fictional world of the narrator's mind. Now, that image of the golden drops in the window is presented in such a way by the narrator, by a narrator remembering an image of window lit hot like oil, that by the time you read it, the image is overlain in your mind. It's reflected like a, an image bouncing between mirrors, and it's as if the reader has seen it again and again, a forced persistence of memory. And so they see it in a blaze in their mental landscape, that golden oil, like a dream lantern of their own inner life. And with that, my editor thrust the book into my hands and he rushed back into his office and he shut the door. <laughs> now, to begin with, I was deeply troubled by this irrefutable analysis of the technical distinctions between my own attempts at fiction and the resonant elegance my editor identified in Manane's work. There seemed to me something essential, some essential quality in the way Manane worked and a kind of freedom to respond to the world on the author's terms, which I was very, very desperate to acquire for myself. Um, and it seemed to me that any apparent distinction between us absolutely threatened the, the likelihood of this acquisition. Uh, now, ex ex exacerbating this fear was an understanding of Australian literature that I'd recently acquired from a very important Australian literary critic who argued for the existence of two distinct traditions at the centre of Australian literature. There's the restrained, Protestant-born, minimalist aesthetic exhibited by someone such as uh, Antigone Kafala, and then you've got the Baroque, ornate, ecstaticians approach demonstrated, you, for example, by Patrick White. Both these traditions, the critics said, stem from the deterritorialized loss at the heart of Australians' colonial culture. Now, whether or not this is true, I had no means of determining at the time, uh, having only a rudimentary knowledge of Australian literature. And in hindsight, the theory was something I followed more by instinct than by any examination. But I did believe it. And, we, and I was faced thereby by a series of very demoralizing data points. First, there are two schools of Australian fiction. Second, the name belonged to the camp of austerity because he was monastic. Uh, and third, I myself was an ecstatician. Therefore, this syllogistic thinking made me conclude that Manane's path along the yellow road of fiction was not one I could take and remain but one solid entity. And it was only a chance discovery much later in my writing life which finally made me aware of how utterly uh, pathetic the mental processing that I've just described had been and how faulty my reasoning was. Uh, uncovering a pile of books under the bed Many years after first encountering Manane's work, I located this collection with a drawing of a racehorse on the cover, set against the map of towns with names that seemed to be the product of a kind of dream sense. Uh, Kegshuj Met, uh, Nagakoros, Jezakegia, Gino, etc. And curious, I opened the book up and I discovered in the contents section that their second essay in this collection was on the subject of Jack Kerouac. And I turned the book quickly back to its cover uh, having neglected for some reason to read who the author was when I first picked it up. And I cringed to discover that it was Gerald Benane because I thought, yeah, surely one of our nation's most austere uh, writers is going to show little mercy to the Catholic excess of style which Kerouac had committed in his career of you know, spontaneous Bob prosody. Unsurprisingly to anyone in the know, the reality of the essay couldn't have been any further from the savaging I'd expected but the effect was no less intense. Manane, apparently, in reading Kerouac, had experienced an, apparent, an equally uh, profound mental emancipation as a writer, as I had felt in reading the first lines of Barley Patch. This is Manane describing reading on the road. The book was like a blow to the head that wipes out all memory of the recent past. For six months after I had first read it, I could hardly remember the person I had been beforehand. For six months, I believed I had all the space I needed, my own personal space, a fit setting for whatever I wanted to do was all around me wherever I looked. My space coincided at last with the place that was called the real world. But the world was much wider than people suspected. I saw this because I saw as the author of On the Road saw. Other people saw the same street of that same Melbourne that had always surrounded them. I saw the surfaces of those streets cracking open and broad avenues rising to view. Other people saw the same maps of Australia or America. 
I saw the coloured pages swelling like flower buds and new blank maps unfolding like petals. So, okay, I read this passage and uh, I felt as if a sheet of ice falling by my feet had revealed a glacier the size of Gippsland that had snuck up on me. The passage I quoted above revealed not only an affinity between Menain and an ecstatician, but the writing itself, the means by which this affinity was declared, was so obviously in the style of someone who could see the shimmering potential lying latent in the apparently ordinary surfaces of the world that he had to be an ecstatician himself. So, uh, in light of this revelation, I immediately flung the book away and marched out into the hall to commence pacing back and forth, uh, slowly rearranging the furniture of my mental space so that Manane would now be seated on the other side of the room with all the other elaborators, as far away from the minimalists as I could place him. But if I hadn't done that, if I had just continued reading the essay, like any normal human being would do, uh, <laughs> I might have been able to acquire you know, a more interesting distinction between Manet and other kinds of literary expectations and writers. Because towards the end of that essay, on, it's called uh, Kerouac in Bendigo, not that I would have bothered to discover it at the time until many years later, uh, Manet recounts his readings of certain Kerouacian biographies and reveals what matters most to him about, Kerouac, uh, about Kerouac's life. And it was the following. He says, I learned that Jack Kerouac as a boy of 12 and about 10 years before I ran my first race on the lounge room rug, used to roll fields of marble racehorses across the linoleum of his bedroom. So what proceeds from this detail that Manain gives is a discuss uh, long discussion of the dream racing that both Manain and his American counterpart conducted in their formative years. Uh, this information fascinated me, not just because I found that it was a typical Menanian focus on the details, uh, a sort of faithful devotion that most presents itself from the external world to the author, but because, uh, kind of solipsistically, my own father uh, used to do the same thing when he was a kid and had likewise cultivated a substantial collection of marbles, which he then gifted to me at some point. So if I had read on and I had come across that detail, instead of just throwing the book away and going berserk, uh, I may have allowed that association between my name and my father and his dream racing to connect, to percolate. And perhaps that would have conjured up in me a particular memory, uh, the memory that I'm thinking of now, which is my father calling me very excitedly into the bathroom in our house in Granville, uh, apparently to look at some incredible thing. I didn't know what it was. He calls me in. He's, he shows me the wall where the tiles of the bathroom, these rose pink squares, the size of a slice of bread, had been steadily falling for years and years and years. So there was basically no tiles left on the wall. But they left these patterns where the glue had evaporated or something and eaten into the wall somehow. And all this kind of asbestos was kind of sticking out. <laughs> And uh, my father put his hands on my shoulders and he pointed to these kind of vestigial shadow shapes. And I was looking at him in the corner of my eye, trying to work out what he wanted me to do here because I didn't want to disappoint him. And he started saying, do you see it? Do you see it? Uh, I looked quickly back at the stains, I was looking at him. And then he says, yeah, that one there, that stain there. Uh, he said, it looks like an Indian hunting a buffalo. And I was like, oh, yes, absolutely. Um, and then he said, look at this one. There's another one. He said, it's like a bloated seahorse caught in seaweed. Uh, and that one is a kind of vague flock of gulls going past the sunset. OK. So had I have resisted the call to toss the book aside, I might have thought of the one thing, then the other. Then this comes to me. Um, and then I might have been able to connect this chain of associations leading from Manane to Kerouac to my father. And I've discovered by doing this uh, a way of contrasting a kind of predilection for passionate overseeing that runs in my family against Manane's most recent injunction in border districts to maintain a purity 
of guarded eye, which many people have already talked about today. Passion, the reason I, I say this is because I think passion is, in a sense, the antithesis to this idea. I read it defined once by a German poet as uh, the perception of an infinitude inside a finite thing. Uh, and to me, that's another way of saying seeing something that isn't there. Uh, and I suspect I know why we should be afraid of the unbound eye, of seeing things which aren't there. Uh, and it's something that I want to exercise as an apprentice writer in my own practice. And that makes me think of something else just quickly, uh, that as a child I was inflicted with what I've heard others call night terrors, you know, dreams in which you lay paralysed and then these faceless shadow men uh, appear at the windowsill and they have these sort of sucking, lidless, lipless mouths. And that you can feel by instinct that if they get you in some way, they're going to suck you into this kind of infernal plane that's so fearful that you wake up screaming and shuddering and you're in shock, you're, in you're covered in sweat. And you can still see these kind of devilish faces glowing inside your mind. Uh, now these nightmare beings, they filled me with such horror of sleep and I was forced to divine a kind of mystic ritual to fend myself against night. And I'd lay in bed and I'd picture one of these demon beings hovering in the air. And then I would encase him in a makeshift prison, you know, either a golden orb the size of a coffin or some sort of concrete tomb. Uh, and around that I'd place some larger confinement. So an immense silver dome or some solid biosphere of iron. And from there you increase the scale. And the planet that this original confinement was located on would need itself to be fully contained. And then that planetary encasing needs to be trapped in some colossal intergalactic holding. And each prison would require another greater prison. And the process would endlessly repeat prisons within prisons, these interdimensional tombs inside the eyes of giants, swallowed by solar storms of ice, and within an atom of uh, uh, the gut of a fish egg or something like this. And it just goes on and on <laughs> until you see outside that the sky is starting to lighten, the sun's coming up, and then you can sleep between that period and you have breakfast. Because um, everybody knows that demons don't have a hold on the earth when the sun is up. And so the problem would be, they could get to morning, but if I accidentally, even for a moment, pictured again that original demon shape, the whole thing is ruined, I have to start again. Uh, so I would perform this complex ritual every night, for many years I did it. And I've always suspected that that's, that activity is the reason I was drawn to writing in the first place. You know, it's kind of seduction of the idea that there's a redemptive plane uh, to be found in mental interiors. And it's only when I was old enough to read unassisted that I could abandon it. Because then I could replace this ridiculous rapture with the act of training my eyes along the lines made by sentences in the pages of books. So, if I had finished that essay uh, way back when and made those few mental connections, uh, I might have reached a position in these lines uh, where it would be possible to interpret the pledge to explain a resolution with which Border Districts begins. And you've heard it already, and I've seen it reprinted again and again uh, in essays about uh, the latest book. But I'll, I'll read it anyway. Two months ago, when I first arrived in this township, just short of the border, I resolved to guard my eyes and I cannot think of going on with this piece of writing unless I were to explain how I came by that odd expression. Now, it's my suspicion that uh, Manain is offering a kind of first principle here uh, for prose, uh, the, at least a certain kind of prose which the author has elsewhere called compound fiction. As such, compounded fiction requires a kind of ecstasy of limitations. Uh, and I see it as like an indulgence of faithful discipline because I think that's what separates a commitment to what you might call the actual, which is the heralding intensity of self-being residing within things themselves from the passionate failure of imagination which cannot distinguish the madness of simple fallacy and fancy from the accumulative truth of a complex fiction. Um, and yeah, I'll just leave it there for now. All right, thank you very much.
Misery.